Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Allison Snyder. I'm a managing editor at Axios. And thank you for joining us for day, today's session. So algorithms uh, used for decision making for hiring and lending, um, policing and more have raised a lot of serious concerns about bias and discrimination. And even if the math or some of the math can be fixed, there are questions about how these technologies are responsibly and justly used and developed and applied. And so countries, companies, and technologists have laid out dozens of ethics, AI ethics principles to try to in response. And we're going to look at how those ethical principles are being put into practice. So at the end of the session, there will be a more detailed discussion among World Economic Forum members. If you're a part of that and you should be participating, please stay on at the end of the discussion for some more instructions about how that will work. And the panel today is in consists of uh, Mr. Herman Greff, who's the CEO and chairman of the executive board of Spurbank, Russia's largest bank, which is also involved in developing Russia's AI, national AI strategy. Um, Yashin Zhang, he is a scientist and entrepreneur who's now the chair, uh, professor of AI science at Tsinghua University, welcome. Athena Kanora, she's the executive VP and chief strategy and transformation officer at PepsiCo. And finally, C. Vijaya Kumar, who uh, goes by CVK. He is the president and CEO of HCL Technologies, which is a nearly 40 year old Indian multinational IT services and consulting company. So thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. And I was hoping we could start by talking about from each of your vantage points, are ethics principles being integrated fast enough to keep up with the technologies in the industries you work in? And maybe CVK, if you could start, that would be great. Yeah, thank you, Alison. Um, when we talk about responsible AI, uh, I think a lot of uh, aspects are still evolving. And uh, if you want to talk about the policies and principles, uh, what I personally believe is uh, we need to have something uh, which is overriding principle, like uh, what is a Hippocratic Oath in the medical world, uh, where uh, first is do no harm, uh, either help or do not uh, harm the patient. I think an, an equivalent analogy uh, is what we should be looking for. I think there are four key principles. Uh, one is, of course, uh, ethical, which is what everyone is uh, highlighting. Uh, this is, to be more specific, I think it's important to uh, responsibly source the data, uh, manage the data, code, and ensure there is an absence of bias and it's being done in a fair and an inclusive manner. The second aspect would be explainable AI, which means uh, there needs to be transparency. Uh, the systems and algorithms should be transparent and should be able to explain to the users and regulators why an algorithm is predicting what it is predicting and why is it making the decision it is making. I think this would be a very important aspect. And the third element will be secure. Uh, whatever systems and the software that we put in place uh, should follow the highest standards of security because anything uh, which gets compromised can have some kind of devastating impact, especially in areas like autonomous driving and things like that where AI is playing an important role. And the fourth element is the accountability and the governance. Uh, who is accountable for these algorithms? How is it being governed? Uh, what is the validation process that we go through? How thorough is the validation process? Uh, and how is the data which is going to build these algorithms uh, free of any bias? I would think uh, ethical, explainable, secure, and accountable are the four key principles which should drive uh, the development of the the AI uh, and explainable AI methodologies. Mr. Graf, may I ask, in in the banking industry, um, how do you how do you see it? Is it is it is are the ethical principles taking um, place with the technology? And if not, what are the gaps? Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Alison, uh, for opportunity to participate in this discussion. And uh, I think that uh, if you speak about banking, 
Uh, Sber now is not a, a bank, it's a huge ecosystem, but inside the core of our business is banking. And if you speak about um, ethic, for us is also a key, uh, key question. And if you speak about the ethic of um, uh, AI, I think that we need to divide uh, uh, this uh, question in two parts. The first one, this is the, uh, who is responsible for that? Because uh, if you create this m machine learning process, the, we, we need to speak about the ethic uh, uh, on, the, on the side of developers. Uh, because uh, everything what is uh, uh, the core of your corporate culture um, can be implemented in the uh, algorithms for um, uh, machine learning. And the second question, uh, what kind of um, um, ethic principles uh, are um, um, uh, more uh, important for banking business? I would like to say that the first question is the security. Uh, secure AI, secure uh, your data and protect uh, the, the customer data. This is the question number one. The second one uh, for us, this is the accuracy. The AI, the models and the results, they need to be accurate. And as a result, on the first two questions, this is the, the third one, this is the trust. We need trust to have trust of our customers. If um, in, in our case, uh, we invest a lot of our efforts in this, in this problem, and um, uh, last year we uh, created a special uh, declaration inside Zber how we use, how we implement AI in our processes and uh, in our products. And it, uh, uh, it, the principles we divided for each stage of a proce product development um, process. Um, uh, product creation, product development, and product placement. And uh, I think that we need to um, speak also uh, about the second uh, part of this problem. We need to have um, A right for mistake because we speak about the people. Uh, in our organization, we have more than 2,000 uh, data scientists and the people who are responsible for AI. And uh, we need to understand if the, if the size of your company is so big, like in the Sberbank, it's uh, you need to be uh, ready to see mistakes and uh, um, uh, what I say that please guys in the first two stages in the product de in, uh, creation product development it's acceptable to have mistakes but in, in uh, production uh, for a bank is uh, crucially important to eliminate all mistakes because it, it would be very painful for um, millions, hundred millions of our customers. And this is the very important question, how we can eliminate this process, how we, how we can uh, organize the, the whole process to verify our models, uh, to um, we organize two different, different parts in our business, different uh, uh, departments who try to validate each model which we try to implement in our business. And this is a very important question. Can I ask Athena and uh, Yashin, um, maybe Athena first, to weigh in on that and sort of, and also to talk about a little bit from your perspective? Yes, uh, thank you, Alison. I'm uh, glad to participate in this panel uh, with uh, such a distinguished guest. Um, let me just start with a fact. The fact is that uh, you know the development of AI technologies uh, is happening so fast, and the framework, principles, and policies that come with that are lagging behind. Uh, and we have to acknowledge that because no matter what we do as corporations and as governments, still this lag will exist, and therefore we have to take action now. 
now. Saying that, what do we do as an industry? And of course, we at PepsiCo, uh, being at the lead of uh, you know the consumer goods industry, we have also a responsibility. Um, if you were to look at how many consumers we touch uh, in this industry, billions of consumers, every CPG company, and we at PepsiCo, we have a responsibility to number one ensure that the inherent bias that comes from the systems, and there is bias on how we manage the data, and there can be bias on how we mine the information, right, through the algorithmic bias that comes with that, and of course, bias on how we approach the consumers through technologies like computer vision, and of course, hyper-personalization. And um, if we look at kind of this whole framework, what do we do with that? So uh, number one, what we have established is a governance layer, right? the operating model on how you manage the three facets of data, algorithmic bias, and the technology, i.e. the connectivity of AI across the value chain needs to happen with strict governance. I, as as uh, Herman said earlier, you know, who is responsible and accountable for the development, deployment, maintenance of all of those AI solutions? Second, what we have established is our playbooks. I, who across the value chain touches those systems so we can have transparency, traceability, and actually visibility on what is the outcome of the full value chain. The third one, we have some clear rules and guidelines aligned with our PepsiCo way as to when we develop AI systems and when we don't develop AI systems. Because inherently AI is being used to be able to mine information and it has to be done in the broader social good umbrella. So we are very clear when it comes to uh, capabilities around recruitment. We are extremely careful to rely fully on AI to be able to do that. When it comes to hyper-personalization, we are Adam and we don't host personal data to be able to mine information around how we target the consumers. So to, to be able kind of to wrap up and put kind of the overarching framework, the industry, the CPG industry has a very big responsibility because of the reach of the consumers and the broader ecosystem that comes with that, i.e. our associates, our employees, and of course kind of the, the small uh, medium-sized businesses that work around this ecosystem and therefore setting standards, AI standards, for the industry to be one of the advocates and work with the government is an imperative. Yashin, you were, um, you work specifically on autonomous vehicles and I'm curious sort of when in, in that realm, um, where do things stand and where do you think the biggest gaps are in time, maybe most urgent and top priorities in terms of the ethical questions that are arising? Because there's a lot, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I think maybe you, you might be muted still. Just better, can you hear me? Okay. We can hear you. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Allison. It's nice to be a part Oh no, I'm sorry. Yeah, Shen, I think we might be having some audio challenges. I'm gonna give him a second and um, I have another question to move on to really quickly. Um, again, this is for all of you. How do you within your organizations empower the people who are set up, who are tasked with developing AI ethics principles? How do you empower them to do the work that they do, especially when it might run up against research or the bottom line? CVK, do you want to take that one? Yes, uh, I think first of all, I mean, we are a technology services company. So uh, there are a lot of development community who is uh, focused on uh, analyzing data, building algorithms uh, for uh, managing a lot of technology landscape and for our clients. Uh, so while we empower them to do the right technical work, uh, we have a governance layer uh, to ensure security, data privacy, to be making sure that we are within the uh, guidelines prescribed by different countries, GDPR and things like that, from how we use data. Uh, that's one aspect. The second aspect is uh, 
uh, we are largely a B2B business, but there are a lot of uh, uh, use cases where uh, uh, we have a large workforce, 160,000 uh, people delivering work for uh, maybe 500 plus clients. Sometimes selecting people for an assignment uh, is done through some level of automation. And uh, there is some amount of machine learning and AI, which is uh, getting embedded. And it is still very experimental in nature. Uh, so we are just making sure that the underlying logic, underlying foundational data is accurate and we can really trace back the reasons and the logic. Uh, that's what we are doing. And uh, it's, uh, it's done, uh, one is while we empower the developers to do what is required to get the right insights, but it needs an overarching governance layer. And uh, that's what uh, we are uh, attempting to put in place. I hope that's helpful. Yep, absolutely, thank you. Uh, I want to try Yashin again, see if uh, if we can, if we've got the audio fixed. Yeah. No, I still can't hear you. No. Nope. Uh, okay, Athena, are you able to weigh in on that question as well? Uh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, a couple of points. Of course, we, you know, we are in the food industry, so we have two communities when it comes to AI. We have the developer community, either people that develop uh, the AI products, and then we have the user community. I, um, the different business stakeholders, whether it's our supply chain teams, our commercial teams, our sales teams, our R&D teams, that uh, are being kind of the adapters of those solutions. Um, so the, the approach that we have is twofold. One is for the developer community, we make sure that they have the necessary um, platform support, service layers, technology to be able to drive that, but as I said before, in a very strict governance. Uh, so we can internally audit what this community does uh, without creating any, I would say, bias in, in the activities that they are um, executing. Um, the important is the user community. What is the level of adoption, usability, um, and, and learning experience that they have around those AI systems? And therefore, we have established literacy programs around technology, data, AI, to be able to upskill them, educate them on the opportunities, but also the risks of those AI systems, how responsibly they can take advantage of the new technologies, and ensuring that the, uh, the proliferation of solutions and capabilities that we develop at PepsiCo uh, is ingested in a way that becomes natural for all the business stakeholders to use, adopt, and enhance the human experience. Because we cannot forget AI is here to enhance the human experience and not to replace the human experience. Can I ask each of you, and um, uh, Mr. Graf as well, I'd like to bring you back in here. Um, last year, IBM said that they would no, not develop or sell facial recognition technology without clear regulations. And I think just picking up on your last point, like, are there red lines that you would draw around AI technologies today, either because they're, they're not necessary in the situation, they're inherently unethical from your perspective, or because they could potentially do more harm than good in their current state? Are there technologies like that where you would say, not now, not yet, not ever. CVK, would you like to start? Yeah, I personally do not think uh, technology per se is a challenge. I think it's about how the technology is being deployed. How do you build it into some of the business processes? I think uh, that's where some potential challenges could come in. Uh, I personally think we should continue to develop uh, technologies because I think always that will be the leading indicator for doing some innovation. But how do we use it? Are we using it in the right way? Do we have secure frameworks? Do we have governance around that? Are you able to explain it? All the points that we talked about. I think there should be more emphasis around that rather than saying uh, we would not invest or develop some technology. So not inherent in the technology, That's but in right. the governance. Yes. Okay. Mr. Greff, are there, I guess, red lines around um, different AI-based technologies that you would that you would draw today? Uh, if you speak about AI, it's a special case. Uh, 
Uh, you, and the first your question was about uh, research and uh, how we empower the people. We have uh, 16 labs in our organization, and each of these 16 labs they use AI technology. Uh, because now everything is based on AI. And I think that you need to give 100% uh, uh, freedom for uh, the people who work on the first stage, on the creation, technology creation, product uh, creation, or uh, they try to create something new to disrupt uh, uh, your business model. And um, uh, I think uh, that uh, Crucially important is the question uh, uh, that we need to put the red lines for um, different companies depend, depend, uh, which depending from the AI maturity. Uh, and uh, in this case, we are in Russia and we are inside Sberbank, we are creating a special AI maturity index for everybody. And we try to uh, evaluate each part of our organization. We do it twice a year. And we uh, provide this idea for the whole organization, including the government. And we try to understand how mature different parts of our business and different organizations inside us. And uh, I think uh, if you are uh, mature enough, what we say, we divide uh, the whole organization on three different parts. Uh, it's an artificial uh, classification, but uh, it helps us. The first one, this is an organization who start implement AI. The second one, this is the AI ready organizations. And the third one, uh, what we call them, uh, AI native organizations. And if you speak uh, about the third part of um, organization, uh, organizations or third part of your uh, business, I think it, it must be no borders to implement AI. And uh, we need uh, to speak only about the, uh, this kind of principles, which called the um, CVK, this um, principles of uh, general accepted AI principles, secure, explainable, reliable, and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And this is the uh, main framework for that. Uh, in, but it's, it's a beginning of the way. And uh, I think that uh, uh, very important is if we can share our experience. And this idea with AI maturity index, I provide to WEF, and I think if we can organize uh, and publish each year with AI maturity index, it would be very interesting and very helpful for everybody. Athena, may I ask, um, what do you think? Are there red lines in the use of AI within your industry or even more broadly, do you consider any? Are you well, I think, I, I think uh, there should be some red lines, right? Um, so no one wants to stop the evolution of technology. Um, but the fact I think everyone would benefit from that. Uh, however, it is on everyone's benefit and especially the societies and the more vulnerable segments of the population to be able to trace back how the AI models, i.e. the algorithms, uh, operate, what is the use I, what is the target that we put the models against which kind of to, to run? And what is the traceability and explainability of those models? Uh, because whether we like it or not, there are many unknown parameters when it comes to AI systems. And of course, you can fine tune them as you see fit based on your corporate priorities or, or your government priorities. But ultimately, we, can, we shouldn't forget that uh, we cannot undermine uh, key social parameters uh, that uh, come with that when it comes to targeting consumers just to benefit uh, you know, the company growth or uh, to target vulnerable segments of the population uh, uh, so we can benefit on, on the back of uh, other competitors. 
so the red lines that we should be putting together and, and, and collectively all the industry sh should aspire to is number one, traceability. We need to be able to track from the beginning of the value chain to the end of the value chain why we use those AI models. Number one, number two, to be able to explain the usage, who touches them and for what reason. And number three, there has to be, as we all discussed, clear governance and a maturity assessment, not just of the companies, but also on the recipients, i.e., you know, the ultimate audience who is affected by the, the use of those technologies. So I think if we are able to put this framework and then align it with policies, government policies, which are much broader than the country uh, borders, then we will all benefit. Um, we've got about five minutes of two questions. Um, so, you know, AI is often framed as a race and it's a race of immense geopolitical importance and consequence. And my question is, does that sort of run the risk of downplaying ethics because of fears that someone will jump ahead and develop a technology or someone else will do it? In other words, is that the, the right framing and, in the, and how do you sort of um, integrate ethics into it? I think, uh, um, Alison, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I think just uh, I was able to uh, dial in. I missed uh, your early question, but let me uh, see. You know, I'm very happy to be part of uh, the panel, uh, and and you know, just from uh, my industry, uh, the the tech industry and the software internet, and uh, we have uh, really come a very very long way uh, in terms of uh, where we stand in the AI ethics. So really, you know, there's uh, three. Uh, uh, things that you have to do to make this work. You know, first, of course, is uh, uh, the uh, level of awareness. We have to start from uh, from the very top. Uh, you know, we, when I started the, the Qinghua Institute for AI Industry Research, I, you know, one of my first email was to state our principle, the three R principles: the you know, responsive AI, the you know, resilient AI, and and uh, uh, and the responsible and and, and the. Re, uh, 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 so, so the thing, uh, you know, when you work on technology, you have to be responsive, you know, to the needs of uh, the industry and the society. Uh, you talk about a ton of striving. You talk about uh, the, the work that uh, accelerates the drug discovery, and the technology that improves personal health, all the things. And also have to be resilient, you know, transparent, uh, explainable, and robust. Uh, and also working on the, the things that reduce data bias the model of vulnerability and, and, uh, and the security. And the responsible as well, especially for engineers and scientists, you have to make sure uh, that you, know, you put ethics and the value beyond just technology itself. Uh, and I, I was uh, the president of Baidu uh, for a few years, actually, and Baidu, uh, you know, there was a committee on, on data for privacy, security, and governance. And I was uh, you know, the chair of that committee and, and making sure we have uh, the right people uh, and, and uh, I have a cross-company initiative. The second element, which is very important, is you have to map this right, into the right domain you know, for your product, your industry. Uh, you have to start with data. To avoid data bias, you have to start with the right kind of data. The integrity, uh, the right of data, the scope of use, and the life cycle of that, that data. And also you have to develop and, and apply the right type of algorithms. Uh, uh, the deep learning, uh, which is a little bit opaque. Uh, there are also other AI algorithms which are more transparent. Uh, and, and they need to uh, somehow making sure there's a logic, uh, the rule-based uh, and knowledge-based uh, that is yes, part of the AI algorithm. And also you have to control the, the training, learning, and the inference. Uh, uh, and the AI algorithm is like a baby. It's, uh, it's like your dog. You have to train it, and making sure you know, it evolves and, and have the right kind of uh, environments. Um, and, and the last one, which is uh, super important, is uh, you have to have an operational framework, the right type of uh, workflow and toolbox, decision-making process. Uh, otherwise, you won't get anywhere. Uh, so in fact, uh, uh, when I was in Baidu, we had a data agent that actually owns the flow and the management data, uh, and and also they help they'll be held uh, uh, accountable. Uh, by the way, actually, I just read the uh, 
uh, the work from uh, the World Economic Forum uh, on unlocking the public sector AI, uh, the AI procurement in the box, uh, the workbook, the tool set. Uh, I thought that was uh, very important because uh, a lot of times you, you talk about AI, you have that level of awareness, uh, but you don't have uh, the right type of uh, execution uh, framework, the uh, right type of tool to make it work. Uh, let me let me just say that I will be well out of time. We were um, we were just having a conversation about sort of drawing red lines around the technologies for for whatever reasons, and I think um, I wanted to ask you actually. You've seen this from different perspectives, right? You have the U.S. view because from your time at Microsoft, you have the the China view. What do I guess business leaders need to understand about how countries view these issues differently? Well, there are obviously a common set of uh, uh, principles, you know, the value, the ethics. Uh, you know, we just talk about uh, some of uh, the, the responsibility, accountability framework. I think it's also important to recognize you know, that there are, there are differences. You know, uh, this is uh, uh, you know, just like uh, uh, the, the, the product you build. The product you build uh, are for different uh, customers. The ones that are built for uh, Chinese customer might be different for U.S. customers. And also you have to understand the, the regulatory uh, differences and understand the, the rules and regulations. Uh, and I'm actually very happy to see uh, both U.S., uh, Europe, and China uh, they have developed uh, a very, uh, over the, in the last few years, a, a, a set of uh, you know, rules and regulations uh, uh, and, and, and the policies. In, in, in China, you know, there, there's a lot of work from different ministries and agencies uh, in terms of uh, security and uh, privacy and and, uh, uh, and, and, and data issues. Uh, so I, I see progress, but also, you know, I think we need to recognize the difference in terms of uh, the, the market and, and the users and the kind of industry. Um, we're out of time, but I want to ask one more really quick question to everyone. So if you could um, just a, a short lightning round. Um, a year ago in Davos, um, almost exactly a year ago, some big tech companies called for more regulation of AI. I want to know which each, from each of you, what would be most effective in the near term in ensuring the responsible use of AI? Is it international normative red lines? Is it informal agreements between private sector players? Is it something else altogether? And I'll start with CVK. I think the most important thing is how data is used. I think that's the, the most important uh, governing or regulation that's uh, required. Uh, Great. Uh, Athena? Yeah, uh, for sure more standardization of the policies, both around data and the use of AI. Uh, currently it's very fragmented, uh, very driven by the countries and not by common standards. Mm -hmm. Mr. Griff? Uh, I think that uh, it's very difficult to predict what we can discuss in one year. Because AI uh, and everything, everything what is connected with AI developed so fast that I think that we need to speak uh, about it a little bit later. But uh, what I would like to say that uh, about the borders of uh, using AI, uh, I think that uh, these uh, 10 uh, commandments from the Bible, this is very important, one very important uh, principle which we uh, need to remember when we work with each of the new technologies. And the first line, if you speak about AI, uh, the, the, I, I call AI technology of the 21st century, which penetrates everything and um, is an um, enabler for um, uh, each of business, if of each of part of our life. I think uh, this, these principles uh, would be um, relevant for each period of time, and then we can discuss how we can implement in our life with uh, um, uh, support of the new technologies, all these 10 principles. Professor Zhang, final word? Uh, yeah, I, I, I was, you know, number one, 
and there has to be an open and candid dialogue in, in, in the government, uh, in the NGOs, academia, and, and industry. And, and the second thing is, uh, uh, you know, I would say, let, let's make sure we have the right technology, you know, the tools uh, to reduce the data bias, uh, to uh, making sure we're dealing with uh, you know, the right kind of uh, uh, framework in terms of privacy, security, and the data solvency. For example, you know, there's a lot of uh, great progress in the last few years in terms of this. You know, for example, uh, homomorphic computing that allow operations done in crypt data, federated learning you know, that can do learning without actually sharing the original and data and the differential privacy, a lot of things, and also the technologies that reduce uh, you know, the, the, the data and leakage and, and the making sure you know, we can add the rules and the logic to the algorithm you know, from black box to, black, uh, to glass box. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, scientists working on those, you know, the knowledge extraction and the making sure it's knowledge driven instead of uh, just data driven. Thank you all again, um, and thank you to everyone who's watching online. 